Life was simpler when Apple and Blackberry were just fruits. Anonymous. Good evening, everyone. Hello. I'm Matt Pro here from Data Heart, and I'm joined by our friend Donut. And this evening, we are going to be talking about phone preservation because Donut happens to be a massive retro phone enthusiast. Oh, yeah. So I have like a, a pretty big collection. Well, big. I don't know if it's big, but I, I have around 30 phones right now. And, 30 uh, phones. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think I have a problem. <laughs> And it's going to expand uh, soon because I ordered like more because I, I saw like a really interesting thing on eBay. Someone was selling like a bundle, but there there was one phone that was like an iPhone, but at the back there was a label that said R&D. So I'm not sure if it's like a prototype or something. I, I was just curious to see what it was. So Interesting. Wow. So you started the collection some two years ago, if I remember correctly. Around 2021. There's like two main reasons why I, I had a, started a collection. The first one is in 2021, I decided to switch from a smartphone to a feature phone because well, I realized I was addicted to my phone. And at the time, I, I bought a Nokia 225 4G, which was released in 2020. I realized that it wasn't a really good experience. And I, and I thought that you know I, I was sure that old phones actually weren't this bad in terms of user experience and well i just led me into a rabbit hole and i started to experiment with older phones and well the other reason was i initially wanted to collect video games but i realized it was a rather expensive hobby so i moved to cell phones because it's it's rather cheap right now the old phones, at least. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I mean, on one hand, I'm surprised that prices are going down, but on the other, it is still quite difficult to manufacture phones, question mark? <laughs> I guess so. I don't know about how they do their manufacturing. You did say you go bargain hunting on eBay, so I'm assuming it's kind of phones people already <laughs> had that they're looking to get rid of, or maybe shops that weren't able to sell because people don't want to buy retro phones anymore. Honestly, I don't know who the sellers, like who, who they are. I just, when I say good deal, I, I buy, but I, I don't think I'm going to buy anymore. I think I have like too many. I don't have space anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if it's not too private a question to ask, do you have multiple SIM cards to go with those phones? Okay, so I have my main SIM card, which is just, you know, for my personal use that, that is uh, active. However, I have multiple SIM cards that aren't active because some older phones, they, they need a SIM card to uh, turn on because some like... Really? The, yeah, older phones, they, if I understand correct, the SIM card itself helps with the processing of, well, the phone. Yeah, I do know that some older phones were storing basically all of their contacts on the SIM card. So it would make oh, yeah, sense. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. That it just kind of asks, I need a SIM card, please feed me before yeah, it works. Exactly. Sometimes when I buy phones from eBay, there are like old SIM cards in there. That's cool. And I once found a SIM card in the Metro on the ground. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a few of them, but uh, I only have one active one. Fair. It's probably difficult to balance several at the same time. Uh, but yeah. do you ever just like have this sudden urge to switch phone models and go up with a Nokia one day and a Sony Ericsson the next one? It's not like on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's more like sometimes I decide, okay, I want to use a flip phone. So I put my SIM card in a, in a flip phone and next, you know, in the next couple of weeks, I use another phone. I, I do that sometimes, yeah. All right, I think that was a nice introduction. Then we can try bridging to the more general question of why do you think we should care about phone preservation? I mean, for you at least, it seems to be a hobby, but what would you like to tell people who don't care so much about... Uh, this is a hobby and just kind of think that retro phones have been obsoleted. Why should we be interested in how mobile phones used to be? Well, I guess in one way you could see it as kind of like a museum where you could see the evolution of the uh, technology. A lot of the older phones, like the very early ones, you had simple seven segment displays and moved in dot matrix displays and then they got smaller and faster and had more features so it you know kind of like preserving harder 
And uh, there's also a softer part, like there, there are many uh, games and applications written for those phones and there are preservation projects for them i'm not too familiar with them but i don't think that they are currently very popular as you know as for retro well i don't know if we can call them retro yet well yeah. some of those yeah. in your collection are definitely retro like the seven segment stuff <laughs> yeah true 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 mm -hmm. but I, there aren't, I don't think there's any games for that phone <laughs> uh snake yeah. can't forget that one. Oh yeah well on, on a seven segment display I don't know. Yeah, I imagine it should be possible, but you're the expert, so. Uh, the one that I own, it's is a sim like a one line seven segment display. So. Oh, it is literally one line. Okay, uh, probably yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's enough uh, pixels to fit it in, but it would look very strange to render. So th that's an interesting challenge for people. If you want to try and hack a seven segment display to play Snake, be my guest. So is, yeah, speaking of games, I do know that there were a, a couple of people active on Twitter. One was, I think, the old phone preservation group. It was like one person, but now it's several. And then I know that various video game preservation groups are especially interested in those. Um, do you remember what they were called? The Japanese... Uh, I-Mode? I-Mode, there we go. That's the one. Uh, that has a very big fan base from uh, what I can tell. Absolutely crazy how high quality those games were, even compared to, you know, today's shovelware that you download from app stores. Yeah, it's it's strange because if you look at the cell phone market in the 2000s, you'd see like Japan being like so ahead in the technology. Like in the very early 2000s, like the Western world, they had like pretty basic phones and, you know, with the dot matrix displays and the thing that people were caring about is, oh, I can have, my ringtone has multiple instruments, ooh. And then you see it in, <laughs> in Japan, it's like, like they, they're having like full color displays. I think they even had like cameras on them and they were using, sending emails. It was like a whole other world. So like they, they had like much more advanced technologies in the mobile world. So it, yeah, and those also came out of Japan, right? Like during that period, because they had the screens to kind of render uh, at least somewhat more complex images. Uh, yeah, so they had like very, um... Wait, what, what was the question? <laughs> Wasn't this also kind of like the time uh, Emoji first came out, uh, out of Japan? Oh, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. I I don't remember. I don't remember. Mm. Probably, well, that's fair. Uh, okay, I'll have to check the sources on it, but as far as I remember at least, it was... Essentially, some phone manufacturers realizing they could put little images into text, like emoticons, which were something yeah, yeah. Uh, recognizable to people who were on the internet at the time. But the cool thing about emoji was that it was supposed to be system agnostic, so if you texted someone an emoji, it didn't matter what phone they had, it would probably be able to decode the image. And the present day has been taken over by the Unicorn Consortium, I think that's what it's called. So nowadays, it's definitely not a Japan-only phenomenon, but when it first started, that's the reason we have so many Japanese-themed symbols, like, I forgot what the flower was called, the Tokyo Tower, and if you actually go to the current emoji website, they have a funny rule that says, no requesting something, because there's a Japanese equivalent. Like, there's a serious protest against not having a Eiffel Tower emoji, for some reason. <laughs> okay. uh, I find that quite funny. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, you, you need to encompass all the Japanese characters. So I'm, I'm sure they had leftover space for emojis, I think. That could have also been one reason that inspired it, right? Because rendering Japanese text is considerably more complex than ASCII was. And then maybe we can talk about... Do you find yourself using any Bluetooth applications? Those were probably more common before smartphones. I mean, we still do have Bluetooth, but it's just not as visible nowadays. I mean, one thing that was big was uh, Bluetooth file sharing. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's much faster than infrared. So you could like share files between two devices without using the internet, which, you know, if it was handy back then. We didn't have like uh, super fast networks. But also, I noticed on one of my phones... It has like a thing called Nokia Sensor, which is an app that you could make a profile on it and it uses Bluetooth to detect like other users around. So if you have like other users around you that is running a sensor, you could like interact with them. 
Now, I never used it because I don't think I'll ever meet anyone in this day and age using this in public, but it reminds me of like PictoChat on the DS, which is a service where you could like communicate with other DS users wirelessly around you, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, and Nintendo, probably being a Japanese company, did keep adding a lot of Bluetooth features in their consoles up until the Wii U, I believe. That was kind of the point where they realized we should do things online, and it just became all Wi-Fi. But it does sound super cool to just kind of walk around and see people via Bluetooth. Nowadays, what I find kind of interesting, I might have talked to you about this before, is the replacement for that has been... I'd like to call smartphone social media. The most egregious example being Snapchat, since in Snapchat you're able to see your friends that are close to you if you have added them before. So it essentially sends your location to Snapchat servers located in God knows where, and then that information needs to be transmitted back to your friends when they log in to see, oh, uh, it just so happens that you are five meters apart from each other. So information has oh, to yeah. travel literal kilometers for you to be able to see that people are right next to you. And I find that almost kind of poetically describing uh, the main issue of smartphones, right? They do things very quickly, but in a very obtuse and sometimes roundabout way. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, speaking of obtuse, do you feel less distracted with retro phones compared to smartphones. I do know from a few people back at my university that there is this kind of trend of if you want to kill phone addiction, you can switch to a retro phone. You won't get notifications anymore, no annoying beeps. You'll just have to worry about text messages. And some people think it improves their productivity or they can just be more calm or relaxed. From what I can tell, though, you do have a primary phone, so you keep your collection separate from your day-to-day -day use, right? Believe it or not, my primary phone is a Nokia 2730 Classic. Oh, it's cool. my current primary phone. It's from 2009. It's a feature phone. I guess it depends on the person. Me personally, I feel like I I rely less on my phone. I am less addicted to it because I used to watch YouTube before sleeping, which is definitely <laughs> not good. So, you know, I, I don't waste time. I don't like waste sleep time anymore. I get to have a little bit more free time and... You know, I read more to pass the time, which is good. You don't so, find the smaller screen difficult for reading? Well, you're not reading on a phone anymore. I guess you're reading physical. No, 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 not on the phone. No, no, that's okay. it. Yeah, on paper. So for me, it's been positive. But there are some people who might complain because I guess they rely too much on their smartphone that they don't know how to navigate without Google Maps or something like that. Yeah, there are many conveniences which you'll probably need to find a specific apps for. Have you actually enough. paid much attention to which of them have marketplaces or not? Uh, good places as in good features? Okay, wait. <laughs> the language here is kind of confusing because with Apple, we just started calling every program on the phone an app or application, right? But in yeah. the retro phone era, it wasn't so much easy to distinguish between what is a feature and what is a, a quote-unquote app. Since you would go into the menu, you had your contact yeah. book, you maybe had a browser, it wouldn't refer to them as apps, and therefore you didn't have app markets like uh, Google Play or Apple's App Store. It, now, it what I'm trying on... to ask is, would you just be locked into what you have? It just depends on if the Nokia developers or Motorola developers thought that you might need this thing or how many of your phones kind of support installing additional features or apps because you didn't have this system that we have now with whatever proprietary app store oh okay okay i get it so it depends on what phone you have like the more basic phones what you get is what you're going to have but on the more mid-range to high high-end phones and the smartphones of the era had like a marketplace to get apps or you could just sideload them as like one popular platform is the java uh, j2me platform later renamed java me huh. a bunch of apps and games were written for it and it was like the most popular one it was i do totally remember that there was an era where java sorry oracle who technically owns java right used to claim yeah. that java would be the super language that dominates all the devices 
And smartphones, people at the time would have, like Motorola, BlackBerry, and so on, did have very much focus on Java, as the probably less sophisticated phones as well. So yeah. it's yeah. interesting how that reality didn't uh, turn out happening. Uh, maybe someone who's more versed in the history of Java might be able to explain as to why, but now it's just kind of an obscure language, uh, unless you're maintaining a system that existed before. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know uh, some of my mid-range phones, they have Java. I think they imagine Java to be like universal. You just put a jar file in the phone and it's going to work. But unfortunately, there are many obstacles to that. If it's a game, for example, it has to be the exact resolution of your screen. Otherwise, it's not going to fit properly. So they had to make like different versions of the same game for different models of phones. I guess in the present day, it's kind of similar to JavaScript, where we say everything runs JavaScript, but the moment you switch between platforms, behavior just becomes very different. So different name. It also has Java in it. Same problem. <laughs> Something seemingly haven't still changed. Yeah, speaking of the present, why not speculate a bit about the future? So we have named quite a lot of things that older phones seem to do right, which we've just kind of lost in the present day. As I mentioned, I think there is definitely not just you, but an active trend of people who are trying to switch back to flip phones and Nokia's. Maybe it's a bit more convenient. I know some phone manufacturers are now making kind of nostalgic phones. Like there's one I saw from a friend recently shaped like a wallet that's supposed to imitate the old flip phones, but it has a white screen that you'd be accustomed to from the iPhones or the Samsung phones. So uh, white like how, how how expensive is that it was fairly affordable i think it was called a foldable phone foldable okay there are several but the one i think i've seen before is called the samsung galaxy flip is that it oh are those are phones with like a foldable screen yeah pretty much so that's what I meant. It looks kind of like a wallet. It's a flip phone. Oh. Well, it's a, basically a modern imagining of a flip phone. That's what I like to think about it. Oh, so it's much those. easier to carry in your pocket uh, compared to like the massive screens we, uh, we've just gotten used to with smartphones. Yeah, it's strange. Like 10 years ago, if your phone had a massive screen, it was called like a phablet, like a combination <laughs> of phone and tablet. But nowadays, we only have phablets on the market. Pretty much. Which, yeah, which is interesting we should bring um, back that word because uh, i don't like calling everything a smartphone i'll use a uh, phablet from now on when i want to refer to in just iphone uh, and uh, galaxy imitations oh yeah i don't know if the foldable phones are any like they're cool i guess it's, i guess there's a cool niche but i don't know if there's like any good use for them i guess if you want to have like a more of a tablet with you all the time in a small shape, I guess. But I don't know. I don't really see the practical use of it. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's some really good practical use. Do you cycle? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. The main thing that I think is, it takes up less space in your pocket, so it doesn't nudge against you if you're cycling, for example. It's also good if you have small pockets, because I've definitely dropped phablets a few times. Essentially has a smaller surface area. I imagine it's just less of a liability. I'm not sure how much the cover will protect it from damage. It also probably functions as a screen protector, since if you're always folding your phone, the screen is probably less exposed to the elements. I can keep naming some advantages, but it seems pretty genius, although very unconventional. Yeah, and the technology, I think it's in its infancy maybe we should wait a few years until it matures just because I, i'm just i'm not too confident on the the screen being long lasting mm. well, I, I bet it's going to be a nightmare to repair such a phone too <laughs> yeah that's also an issue that's maybe something to talk about yeah right to repair is a big deal would you say older phones were easier to repair, both in terms of the actual hardware, but also the companies being uh, menaces about it? I've repaired a few Nokias, and the older ones, they're, they're really, really, really easy to repair. It, it, you do need a special uh, screwdriver bit, but you, you remove the outer shell, you unscrew like six or like eight screws, and 
the the rest you can just every piece every module on the phone like they go in each other like legos and in some models there's not even any flex cables there's nothing it's just like metal pins that can contact each other when they get sandwiched when they're assembled but like it's it's so easy you just find the broken component and you replace it and that's literally it there's no cable there's nothing you just i find that like it's a really good design although i don't know if it's uh, going to be compatible with modern phones with, with all the components we have on the modern phones yes uh, i was actually talking to glmd grielsen some time ago about how it's so different nowadays with most smartphones i'm not just referring to phablets generally seem to use solid state drives for storage space and that's as just a, as opposed to what would what would it be if it wasn't solid state like what would it, like what was the the previous what, what, like was, a, what was used before i'm not sure what came before actually the only point i was making is you can't really you don't try to fit a hard disk into a phone um i think the nokia once put like a a mechanical hard drive on the, the N95, like you had like an eight gigabyte version. I'm not sure though, I may be wrong. But it would be fun to see a phone that you pull up and it starts uh, just making whirring noises, whirling noises. Oh yeah, <laughs> iPods had a hard a hard drive, I think. The first generation? Uh, many generations after the first one. That's how they afforded to have really large capacities in the older iPods. Yeah, anyway, so that's just interesting things to talk about. Um, I guess the talk of the town lately has been this new pressure on different manufacturers to use a USB-C for everything. Yeah, and Apple has finally changed to yeah. USB-C. <laughs> but USB-C comes quite a bit after most of the retro phones we are familiar with, right? Yes. The most common connector I see are micro USB, and on some phones like Sony Ericsson, because you know how Sony they like their proprietary stuff, um, you got lots of proprietary connectors on there. So otherwise, on older phones, you have for charging a barrel plug, literally. And I guess phones, you could consider the mini USB as a precursor to the USB C in some ways. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It's like they're the mini USBs and the micro USBs. Those are the most common in the USB world on the phones. Okay, it's a bit of a stretch, but you could say this is kind of something we are bringing back, uh, even if it's in a kind of different way. The same deal with flip phones now being full. What I mean is it's still the USB family, although it's not a mini or a micro, but the USB-C, which is maybe the latest iteration of the same idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. But, I mean, if you look at the non-iPhone world, I think most Android smartphones had micro-USB and later USB-C. So, in my viewpoint, we've always had USB in the cell phone world. Really? Because I've had the problem of going to find a USB-C, but it turns out I need a mini. Going to find a mini, but it turns out I need a USB-C. So I did feel the shift when it occurred. Not so much nowadays, since USB-C seems to be at the white standard. Oh, no, I was just talking about, like, it was USB, as in generally USB, whether it be mini, micro, or C. Yeah, okay, so that's kind of technology trends, but let me ask you, as a certified expert, what is something you have seen within your collection that you want brought back, but haven't seen any effort in that direction? If you could inspire the next generation of phone designers, what would you tell them? Phone designers like smartphones or people who keep making future phones? Because Both they, is fine. Still exist. Both is fine. <laughs> okay. Well, I've used a couple of modern feature phones because, you know, I wanted to test out those with like an LT modem in there because 3G is not going to last very long. But on the modern phones, like... Uh, Shandy Global, who owns the Nokia brand, they make they make phones such as well the ones that I've used, like the Nokia two twenty five four G. The firmware on the phone really sucks; like it's it's really bad. 
it, it works, but it's just buggy, and I think it, it just lacks a whole lot of features. It would be great if it took the time to really design something really good, good firmer, like how Series 40 used to be, which is the Series 40 is the like the OS of the, the mid-range Nokia's of the 2000s. Like, I don't know if they have the rights to the Series 40 software. If they do, they should just take Series 40 and just smash it into like a new phone. I don't know if that's even possible. I don't know if it's compatible with the modern hardware, but at the very least, they should actually design something like a, a good operating system for these phones because like the, the, the main obstacle for me with these new phones is really called the OS. It's, it's really bad and yeah. You don't like it all being Android? Well, then again, I don't know about the feature film ecosystem, so... Oh uh, yeah, so right now with Nokia, they have S30+, Plus, which they started it back during the Microsoft acquisition, well, after the Microsoft acquisition. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, S30+, Plus uh, is a really basic OS. Uh, it really feels like a, a rather more basic uh, phone then a mid-range phone would get you in the 2000 with the series 40. So yeah, no, I don't like S30 Plus as an OS. I think it's really buggy and it doesn't let you have a lot of fun. You can't even side load applications on there. It's really what you get is what you get pretty much. There's another OS called Kai OS, which runs on phones that are a bit more, they're a bit smarter, but the OS is just really slow and filled with, filled with bloatware, so I'm not a fan of that. Then and why I'm, would you have bloatware on such a poor machine anyway? I like have a, no idea. Okay. <laughs> Money, I guess. Like, it's filled with, like, Google and, and stuff, like, yeah. Yeah, that would make sense then. That was Mozilla's monetization strategy, right? Just have your suggestions toolbar be sponsored. And I'm guessing then the feature from market would do something similar since they need additional funding. And they say, uh, maybe to Google or some other company, uh, pay us this much and we'll put a logo on the startup screen, which lets people just go into their Gmail account instantly. I, I don't know. Uh, this is just me imagining. That's yeah, possible. But it would explain kind of why there is so much bloatware. But I, isn't bloatware usually OS native when I think about Windows, for example? I mean, I guess you could uninstall them. Mm. Like on Windows, every time I install... I hate Windows 10 so much. Not alone. Um, yeah, no, every time I have to install Windows for whatever reason, the first thing I do is that I just get rid of all of the bloatware, just strip all of that. I just can't. But it's the same thing for, like, phones. I don't like bloatware. And that just makes the experience, overall experience worse, in my opinion. And do you think it significantly speeds it up when you do strip the bloatware? On a computer, it makes a difference, but on a feature phone? Well, for KaiOS, I think I needed to root the phone, which I haven't done. I, there are some apps you could actually uninstall, like Facebook, but some apps like Twitter, which is pre-installed for whatever reason, you actually couldn't uninstall like just like that. You needed to root the phone, and I I just realized something. What happens if now with the Twitter and X drama? that they decide all of a sudden that they want to disable the Twitter to X redirect, then all of those pre-installed Twitter apps are no longer going to work, right? Maybe, probably. Yes. Interesting. The, the weird thing is on KaiOS, if I remember correctly, all the apps are actually just mere HTML and JavaScript, which is really strange, but that's how it is. And so I'm guessing like the, the, they'll just uh, have like an updated version because I think it's just like a web browser thing with the twitter app i mean hmm. it's, really, it's really strange the ios never really uh, understood what they're trying to do funny stuff okay so the main thing you would do is have a better os yeah for sure like the hardware hmm. is fine like right now they, they still have removable batteries they still have micro sd card readers and headphone jacks like hardware wise you know i'm fine with it it's just a software that's really bad, that really needs uh, like a good update. All right, so less bloatware and just a feature phone with even less features. Maybe that's one way to put it. I don't know if... I mean, I don't want Facebook or whatever pre-installed, so... 
to me, it's a good thing. Having less features. I mean. All right. Then thank you so much for this evening because I've been meaning to have this interview with you for some time now. I'm glad we got to do it as a podcast because it feels like phone preservation is one of those things you can't just open a conversation about. Since compared to hardware preservation, as you mentioned, with retro computing, it's not taken as seriously. So Yeah, there's a lot of fans of retro computing and, and video game preservation, but cell phones, is not that... No one really thinks about cell phones, so... But I think it's yeah. changing, so let's just keep talking about it, and then maybe it'll get some people's attention. Oh yeah, one thing I, I, I wanted to mention that I completely forgot. At one point, we're not going to be able to use some older phones anymore due to the networks shutting down their legacy uh, 2G and uh, 3G networks. Uh, I think that's important to mention. Really? In some, yeah, in some parts of the world, like right now here, we have 2G is essentially gone. Like there's no more GSM anymore. Like it's completely gone. Now, I, I have many phones that are on 3G, so I can survive for like a couple of years. But after that, I'll have to uh, find a, an, alter an alternative with an LTE phone. Interesting. So I'll definitely be keeping an eye on that if people try to DIY to keep the 2G networks alive. That's what happened with radio stations, I believe. When radio stations kind of went bankrupt, the tower would just stay, but they wouldn't do broadcasts. So people would wander in, hijack it to do their own broadcasting. Some people That's call it cool. amateur radio. Those who don't like it call it, I think, pirate radio. Something like that. Yeah, I think it's called pirate radio because amateur radio, it's another it's a hobby. A more legal hobby. <laughs> <laughs> the more legal version, yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, then we should just sign off yeah, okay. by saying yeah. goodbye. Think of a funny way to say it. Thanks for having me on the show and. Uh, um, na 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 na. Na 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 na. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I hope to have you on here again. Then uh, this was really All right. fun. Okay. All right then. Thank you so much. See you. See you.